Welcome to the Vet Dental Show. I'm Brett Beckman. I'm a board-certified veterinary dentist, and we come to you every week on Wednesday to provide the veterinarian and the technician team some actionable things that you can use in your practice. And this episode is going to be a recorded episode that we've done in the past, not a podcast that we've recorded or not the Vet Dental Show, but actually some other information for you that we know you're going to enjoy. So sit back, enjoy, and we'll see you at the end of the podcast. So uh, first question uh, is from Mandy. Uh, she said, uh, case 13, uh, in cases like a boxer with gingival hyperplasia, I've always just removed the tissue with cautery, but never extracted the underlying teeth if there was no evidence of pathology. So um, let me let me approach that part of the question first. Uh, so what I wanted you to get out of that case was you just don't go in there and see the hyperplasia and then start to remove it with whatever method that you want to remove it with. And there are many. Uh, and some of you uh, mentioned cautery. Uh, some of you obviously are using... Uh, the electrosurgical units, uh, scalpel, the burr that we use with the scalpel, the the uh, uh, twelve fluted burr, all those are fine. But you do not want to go in there and start doing that until you take radiographs and eliminate the possibility of pathology associated with that periodontal tissue. So if you have significant bone loss, just like you would in any any perio case. That area uh, needs to be flapped. It needs to be, uh, the teeth need to be extracted. And then the tissue needs to be contoured such that you can close it. And that usually uh, uh, involves removing a, a lot of that productive proliferative tissue to make a nice smooth margin so that you can suture that to the palate or you can suture it to the lingual mucosa. So I hope that clears that up. That was that was a, a resounding question that everybody had. Why you know why would we extract teeth with gingival hyperplasia? That's uh, the reason why we don't just go in and start excising tissue. We need to treat this like any other case that we see with full mouth radiographs first uh, before anything. Uh, even if this is not a case where you've got hyperplasia existing over all of the teeth, you still want to take full mouth radiographs just like you would in any other case. The other thing that I want to point out, any brachycephalic is a very difficult extraction. So these are complicated by the fact that they, they do have a lot of proliferative tissue and so that they're not your run-of-the-mill surgical extraction flap exposure. They're, they're a little bit more involved. Plus, since it's a brachycephalic and it's a big brachycephalic in most cases with the boxers, you've got all of that dense cortical bone that gets denser the more apical you go. So it makes these very difficult. Unless you are really skilled at surgical extractions in other patients, I would strongly recommend that you refer these uh, and and if you're not strong in surgical extractions and have had a lot of, uh, of uh, experience and skill, I would also strongly consider referring brachycephalics in general. Uh, we had a question, I think, in uh, may have been in the workshop, uh, but I think it was in the academy about extracting. Oh, actually, it was a live text that I got this week about extracting a tooth that was partially ankylosed in an 11-year-old brachycephalic dog, uh, and it was a mandibular canine. And those, you, you even if you are well-versed and comfortable doing mandibular canine extractions, that would not be one that you would want to do in practice. That would be one that you would want to do uh, uh, or want to refer. So keep keep those in mind. Okay, uh, another, good, another good question that we had a lot of. Uh, no, you can't tell tissue is benign without submitting for histopath. So should so anything you remove should be submitted, question mark. What should the course of action be for, for this patient? So uh, another great quest, question that um, requires a bit of an explanation for an answer. When we are, when we're looking at gingival hyperplasia, 
gingival hyperplasia and epulids, or now they are called peripheral odontogenic fibromas, are very similar in some cases visually. Histopath that you are looking for when, when you excise in these cases and submit for pathology is not really either one of those. It's more to find out if one, if one or multiple areas that are more angry looking than the rest might be something else. And the reason I say that is the gingival hyperplasia will come back and so it is going to require some maintenance. Uh, we can go in, we can take radiographs, we can extract teeth that are uh, periodontally affected significant enough to warrant extraction and then close that tissue and that area is is more than likely not going to ever have any any additional hyperplastic tissue because it's not adjacent to a tooth on the other side of that is the uh the epulis and that being said with the with the fact that we're going to have to come back on these hyperplasia cases uh, you can assume that if you've got multiple lesions like that, that most of them are going to be hyper, hyperplasia, but you could have an epulis or two in there as well. But we have to ask ourselves, unless it's a really encompassing lesion and it's going to grow quickly uh, or, or otherwise cause problems, then uh, we, we don't care. Uh, for the most part, because we're going to be coming in there and we're going to be doing six to 18 months generally, uh, excisions with our, in our case, our 12 fluted burb. We're just going to go in there every six to 18 months, depending on the patient and how fast that grows back and just recontour. We're, we're not really having to go in, hopefully, and, and re-excise with a scalpel because we're trying to, trying to maintain those from now on. So that, Epulis, or that peripheral odontogenic fibroma, or POF, acts in much the same way almost all the time, is it's not going to grow back with vengeance. It's going to grow back at a, at a rate probably similar to the hyperplasia. So knowing that those don't do anything else, but knowing that they're very similar histopathologically with gingival hyperplasia now, we didn't always know that, but we have, we have recognized that in the last couple of years, that we can treat them kind of the same way. If we have uh, an epulis or a POF versus hyperplasia, we evaluate the periodontal tissue, we extract, and then we contour uh, just like we would in if it were hyperplasia. So I hope that I hope that um, straightens that out for everybody. Also, if any, let, let's say for example, you do have a, a POF that is acting more aggressively than the rest of the hyperplasia, then you may want to go back and biopsy uh, to confirm if you didn't biopsy originally. And if that is uh, historically coming back quicker, then the treatment for that is to extract the tooth with the actual mass. So, uh, so the tooth is, or, or the mass is derived from the periodontal ligament cells that surround the tooth if it's a POF or an epulis. So extracting the tooth and making sure that the alveolus is clean or taking, in our cases, as a, uh, as a specialist, we would take, in some cases, an in-block resection of that. Um, I, I would not recommend that you guys do those in-block resections. If that case, uh, again, to clarify, that case Unless you're really skilled, that should be a referral for removal of that mass, unless you're really comfortable. And that's why I took another tooth adjacent to it, because that tooth itself would have required a real narrow base flap and a lot of dissection that would make it prone to dehiss. So by taking a wider base flap, then what you're doing is you're ensuring that you don't have as much tension and that you're going to be able to close that. So 
again, I don't recommend that you do those. I recommend that unless you're really versed, uh, don't do end block resections. If you've got a small gingival mass that you can excise, you can take the tooth and you can close it without removing a lot of tissue like we did on that, on that one case, then by all means, go ahead and do that. I trust you enjoyed that episode. We enjoyed providing it. If you would, do us a big favor and go to our iTunes page, post a rating and review, and take a picture of that with your cell phone, and then post it on our Facebook page, and we'll send you the Instrument Use Essentials course. If you also look below, there is a link to two live trainings that we do. And one is on radiographic interpretation. The other is on killer tips for quicker extractions. If you have not been to those, register for the one that's coming up next. And the link will be in the show notes on the website, The Vet Dental Show. And we'll get you in and get you a... 30-minute, 40-minute overview of those topics that are really insightful and all take home. And then we'll also give you an opportunity to get a great deal and some bonuses on those two courses that are online courses that span uh, five hours and seven hours. So hopefully you enjoyed this episode. Hopefully you'll help us out uh, with the post on our Facebook group. And then as a little extra bonus for you, you've got that link down there. You can register if you haven't been to either one of those and enjoy all of that content uh, that we're going to give you on those two topics. So take care. We'll see you next week.